No, thank you very much. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna uh, try to give a little bit uh, of a um, preview what we want to do on the project that we got granted now. Uh, and it has a little bit of a technical load, but I will skip that and we can uh, have questions, of course. If you want to interrupt, just interrupt me. And if the question is too complicated, I will push it to the end. But feel free to interrupt so uh, you don't get lost in the way. OK, so um, just quick, I have a background, uh, which is uh, physics. But I work in many projects. I'll call them very interdisciplinary. And um, always I was dealing with uh, models of uh, real systems, so real life systems. And um, I always felt uh, that uh, we have tools that are not suited to cope or to exploit the natural properties of this, which is nonlinearity. So for me, always a, a, a driving force is okay, how we can exploit or uh, deal better nonlinear uh, systems. So how can we do it better? So beyond linear algebra, I would call it. And these are some of the projects, doesn't really matter. So today, um, the core thing we're going to discuss here today is this idea that we, we have some uh, measurements of a system. And uh, with this measurement, we want to make some inferences, either to predict future state of that system or to identify parameters of the underlying processes. So we have a model, maybe, of uh, the system we are observing. And then this model has parameters. And we want to know values of those parameters, because we cannot measure them directly. And uh, this we do based on the data we, we obtain. And um, I'm going to quickly review some of the popular, let's say, methods to do this. And we'll try to or we'll show a, a way of unifying them into a single hood so we can really stop uh, differentiating them uh, <coughs> in the hard sense. And um, then we're going to discuss quickly how we use them for emulation and what is emulation, and then a little bit on tricks uh, how to deal with the uh, large systems. OK, so we go. First method is regularization, uh, regularized regression. Basically, this is a curve fitting for many people. And here is an example of the least square error. So we have some data, y, j. And then we have a, a function that will model that data. And we say that we're going to search for, for a good function that approximates our data. So this here will be the least square term. So find a function such that evaluated at the input, you get a very close to your measured data. But then we will add an extra cost there, which is called a regularizer, which essentially is something that measures a property of the solution we found. So um, what we do here is we apply some operator on f, and we say, OK, if this guy is big, these functions are less likely to represent the data, although they may be very close to our data points. So it's, we, we weight them based on this. And this way, we encode our prior knowledge we have about what Fs are good for our data. Um, so this is, I hope, a common for you. Many control problems, have, uh, optimal control problems, have this shape. Um, this is an example. Basically, we are doing n plus 1 degree polynomial regression on n points, and we are asking that Whatever polynomial you found, it needs to uh, minimize the second derivative on the whole range. Right? So this will be the operator uh, on applying on f. It will be the second derivative, the operator. And what you see basically is kind of like the violet line here that is almost not regularized. It's going through all the points almost exactly, except maybe for this one down here. Um, because a polynomial that can go through all the points. Right, it's n plus 1 degree polynomial, so it could fit. But when we start putting weight on the um, a regularization term, if we put too much weight, we fully penalize only those guys that are bent. So the system will fit a line on the data. This will be just the linear regression of our data. But if we put values intermi intermediate values of this uh, uh, importance we give to the regularization term, we can get pretty close to the actual generating process here was this uh, thick Blau, um, blue line, which was that line plus some noise. Hmm? So uh, if we regularize and we know, OK, this should be, for example, a second order or a third order polynomial, although we give some flexibility, uh, we can get pretty close. So you see, for example, the yellow or the green line are very close to the real uh, system. And that happens for some level of the regularization. OK, this is a trivial example. You will not do it 
this with a polynomial regression, but it's just to uh, um, show that although we are fitting n plus 1 degrees polynomial, we can choose those that bend the less in the interval where we have the data. And that you do through a regularization process. OK. So um, this is just for the technical savvy, but essentially this also sets the, the ground for the unification afterwards. When we have this problem like this, it's kind of usually it's a mix of some discrete and some continuous stuff. So we convert it into a variational problem using the delta here. So this term here was the summation. Now it's continuous stuff. And through this, we can arrive to a, a operator equation, which is here, involves the square of the operator r. And if we find a green function for that operator, then we can exactly solve this uh, regularized regression problem. So essentially, we convert the usual optimization problem into an operator problem. And if we can solve that operator problem, then we can write exactly the solution to the problem. And, um, and that's it, basically. This is true when this part here is convex. So it's not general, this, this step here. But uh, it's quite general if you see what is being used for regularized regression. So like squares and uh, norms and things like that. Uh, so essentially, the solution, then when we find this green function, looks like this. I just want you to look at the shape of this structure. I just colorize things that are important. Here we have an inversion of the green function evaluated at the inputs, at the observed uh, inputs. And then uh, we're going to use this to project uh, the data. So this is the data and uh, some uh, mean function that we're going to discuss later on. And then the, this will, convert, will become some weights that we're going to use to the actual green function to evaluate at any input. Right? So this we are generalizing here. You see this is only on data. This half on data, half on a free input we're going to evaluate. And, um, and this is the solution again to a regularized regression problem with a convex loss function. Mm -hmm. We say, well, that's very interesting. Uh, but now it comes to Gaussian processes. Gaussian processes is um, essentially a, a method to um, describe random functions, so f a, a distribution of functions. Um, that means we have a function, and then we have some variations of that function that if you take, if you look them, like if you make an histogram of them, you will obtain a, a Gaussian distribution. And, um, and the important thing is to define one of these guys. We define, as we do with a Gaussian distributions, a mean function. So a mean value will be for Gaussian distribution. Here we are talking about process. We talk about a mean function and a covariance function. So like the standard deviation. This will be the mean and the standard deviation of the Gaussian. And um, what we do is we say, OK, we make some hypothesis about what are the, the values of uh, this m and k, or what the structure of this m and k. And then based on the data, we can condition that distribution and obtain a new distribution that uh, reflects the properties of the data, so the statistics of the data. And when you write the math of that, you obtain this solution here. So if you have some kind of visual memory, you already see that the structure is exactly the same as we had before. And this is how we're going to get to plug these two methods. So we have here now the covariance functions. We have the inverse of the covariance function on the data. And then we have the mean value. Um, acting on, on the data and then helping us to shift our predictions correctly. Kappa would be zero by for now. Kappa? Yeah, so OK, this is the regularization thing uh, we mentioned. We can forget about this term, indeed. Yes, this is a general result. We can forget about this term, yeah. Maybe we discuss what it means later on, if we have time. So let's make an example. So here in gray, you see this thing of the Gaussian process. So essentially, we have many, many functions that are generated by evolving a first order uh, linear system, so like a tank that is filled with water. We, we take this tank, and then we put random water on it. And um, it starts at some level of water, and then starts draining out through a little hole it has on the side. And um, so the noise makes takes care of doing this thing. And maybe at some point, we were some uh, um, tap was open. I was filling it. So it was not draining so fast. But then we close the tap, and then it drains very fast. Okay, it's Just this typical first order linear ODs. Right? And um, so what you see here in black is the mean function. And then all the great things are realization of this noise, of the noisy input we put there. 
And what you get is this distribution, and because of the properties of the system, in fact, because it's linear, and because the noise is Gaussian, you get a Gaussian process here. Um, OK, so it, again, what you obtain at the end is a distribution of functions, so you're going to be inferring on this distribution. What's the mean? What's the deviation? And because it's Gaussian, you don't look at anything else. OK, so if we look at this covariance function we mentioned before, uh, it looks like this. So basically, this is a correlation between these signals across time. So if two signals are very close to each other, there is high correlation. And if they are far away from each other, then they are not correlated. This is kind of like a measure of the memory of the system. And if you make a cut here vertically, you, you, look some, you see something like this. <coughs> this covariance function is completely related to the dynamics of the system. Okay, it's fully determined by the dynamics of the system. And, um, and it's a, well, one observation we can make here is that it's non-stationary. That means that this, the way this thing is painted here, it depends on the actual value of the time and not only on the difference between these two times. So if you will see here something that's per that doesn't change color oops, in the diagonal direction, something that doesn't change color in the diagonal direction, that will be stationary. But because this guy, for example, the diagonal comes from black to white, it means that along the time passes, correlations will change. So it's not only about the distance between two time points, two inputs, but also when is this uh, difference happening. So what does that mean for, for the water tank? Sorry. For the water tank, it, this means like this, if you wait enough time, all the signals will be at zero because uh, it's empty, right? So at the end here, at very long times, so what you're going to get is just the, the standard deviation of the noise that you have there, and nothing else. So it will be correlated as the noise was correlated. Right? So, but at the beginning, you can have anything because also you have this input that uh, was going in there. It's so this is in a linear setting. Yeah, it's all linear. I would say this increases, yes, but, but I'm not sure. So we can more uncertain at the end of the simulation. So you're, it, okay, it all depends what, here you will have more or less uncertainty depends on the, how much is the variance of the noise. Mm -hmm. If the variance of the noise is very little, so at the end you will be as uncertain as the noise. But you will, all the mean values will be zero. Right? So. Okay. But in this particular case, there is no. So I would say in this particular case, you are more certain at the end because only the noise uncertainty mm -hmm. and not the dynamic uncertainty. Here, you will have be more uncertain because how the system reacts to the particular realization of the noise. But I could check this. What are the actual value of this diagonal? I think it increases, though. Uh, yeah, it does increase because it's a linear on time. It has a t multiplying it, so it grows. Um, again, this is the example here. What we have is uh, the observations of this tank. So we have one set of, uh, this one realization of the discharging tank, and then we observe it here, 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 and nothing else. And then we apply this methodology here, the kappa is gone, as Carlo was saying, there is no noise. And then uh, we can regress this with a proper covariance function, which is the one I showed before, and we obtain this uh, green line. And then, of course, if you do it with another covariance function, we can, you can choose because this covariant doesn't encode the dynamic of the system, you get good interpolation property, but the predictions are wrong because it encodes the wrong dynamics of the system. We're going to go to another example of this thing. So what it means here, you need to know your data. So you choose the right covariance function. So there is no free lunch. In a way, you're given data, are going to learn something out of this, and this will be good. That's, I would say, 99% of the time not true. So you first need to understand what your data is about, then you're going to propose the right methods to approximate the data. Uh, OK, so the third method, and the last one, is Kalman filters, um, or smoothing. So these are iterative methods. Just let me go back a little bit. Oh, too much. Um, so you see here, we have to build these objects, these matrices that are big, and they contain kind of like hold the information of the system in one snapshot. Well, we have basically the values for all possible time inputs. So kind of the system is frozen, and we have the information about all possible things that can happen there. When we come to an iterative method, we only see the actual values. W what's happening now? We don't know. We don't have a, a, we don't use information of other time, or at least not explicitly. So these things iterate. It takes current value, update something, 
next value updates and they don't look at the whole picture of the system. And they are used to approximate parameters or to make predictions on models of this shape. So we have some evolution of some state x given by a linear equation that have noise. And then we're going to observe these states and probably also the inputs, it doesn't matter, at some given time step. Because here we are dealing mostly with continuous time system. You see here that the evolution is continuous, but the observations are discrete. We are kind of digitalizing the signal. right? And, um, and these methods are very effective, and they are much used in signal processing because of this property here. So the, the time it requires for one of these systems, to, for all these methods to, to execute, will be linear on the number of time samples you have, and will be cubic only on the size of this vector x here. So how many signals you, you are looking at. This is not really the size of x, but really the size of y. Maybe not completely right here. Um, OK, so I guess you are all familiar with these methods. But again, we're going to just make a sketch. All these flavors of Kalman filters look like this. You start with some initial value, which may be your first observed value or some guess you have about the initial state of the system. Then you simulate forward, iterating this thing here, or solving this differential equation forward in time. You propagate the error. Then you, oh, I found a measurement. Then you condition this system you were uh, propagating on that measurement, and then you come back and correct your, your prediction. You do this forward in time all the time. So you go pack, 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 and you advance. And then when you're done, you can ask for a time in the future where there is no observation yet. And then it will tell you, well, I'm guessing this based on what you have seen before. Um, OK. So. We're going to unify these three guys. We already discussed a little bit what happens with regularized regression and Gaussian processes. Essentially, is looking at what is the formal solution. So this is a regularized regression solution. It looks like this. This is Gaussian processes predicting mean. It looks like this. Not very hard to see. They are exactly the same thing. And the green function of the regularization operator is the covariance, or the square of the regularization operator is the covariance function. And these were signals on the null space of the realization operator define the mean function of your process. Right? And with this, again, if you are in the linear, sorry, in the um, convex loss or convex co co cost scenario, doing a least square fitting or doing Gaussian process is just the same thing. But moving from one to another may help you you know, make a more clever or interpret your results in a very different way. This is in the paper by 2008, where the guys kind of digested all this information that was out there, especially by the mathematicians. <coughs> it's a paper on machine learning. And essentially, they show all equivalences between these two views on the uh, problem, on the learning problem. And here, the important one is from uh, this, the vertical axis. When we take a regularization operator, we create a covariance operator, and then we can do uh, the Gaussian process inference. But if you have a Gaussian process inference problem, you can look at the <coughs> covariance operator. And by taking the square root of that operator, you can see also, OK, what's a regularized operator if somebody was doing a curve fitting with this thing. Now, here is a star because this square root is not unique. So there are many solutions there, or even sometimes not possible. So um, this way. It's always possible. This way, it's not always possible. So if you are doing some crazy Gaussian process regression, it may be that you cannot see it as a regularization process, as a, a curve fitting process. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's it. Now, just a hint for the ones who know about this. This axis is the one that's going to give the unification with the Kalman filtering thing. But uh, we're going to do it different. So in this paper, <coughs> these guys basically take the a pendulum, linear, linearized pendulum, so spring and mass system. It's a second order differential equation. They build the covariance operator. It's a system with two states. This will be the position here on top, and this is the, the velocity. And then they simulated a system of this kind, and then they put the x's here. These are samples of the trajectory of that pendulum. And then they say, OK, if we do uh, Gaussian processes with this thing, we can infer uh, the states where there is no observed trajectory, <coughs> and we get that. It's pretty good. 
to reiterate on the other thing, if we use another kernel, not the one obtained from the dynamical system, you get always very good um, interpolation properties. You get very small confidence intervals because say, yeah, I'm really good at modeling this data. But when you go out of the outside of the data, you're very bad at predicting, just because you encoded the wrong dynamics of the system. Um, and in this paper, they compare with the Kalman smoother. Right? They say, OK, look, if you do this with the Kalman thing, you get exactly the same solution up to a machine epsilon. And they discuss, they say, OK, this is because Kalman smoother are proved to be the, op the optimal solution <coughs> for prediction under Gaussian noise. A, Gaussian process regression is exactly the same thing. Therefore, if the problem is convex, it has a unique solution. Therefore, the two solutions must be the same thing. And that's how they established the equivalence in this paper. But there was no, you know, we I cannot go from one method to the other with this idea. I just know they both give the same. But if I'm doing Gaussian process regression, I want to know, okay, what is the equivalent way of doing it with Kalman filter, right? And vice versa. <coughs> so um, here comes Anthony O'Hagan again. Like in the 80s or 1978, he wrote this paper basically essentially on Gaussian uh, process regression for a long time series. Right? He called it <coughs> curve fitting and optimal design for prediction. And he wrote this paper. And then he got, as a review, he got the, the big guys of the moment on uh, Gaussian processes <coughs> to as reviewers. So each of the guys you see the, were the reviewers are geniuses. So the paper was republished with the review process, because there was more value on the review than on the actual original paper. right? And then in this review, he writes, so all these guys were criticizing that what he was doing is essentially Kalman filtering, but with, just with a different wording. And then O'Hagan said, well, I'm sorry, this may be Kalman filtering. They all mentioned the affinity between my results and Kalman filtering. But I said, but if the works you publish were readable by normal people, then I wouldn't have done this. Right? Essentially, he was kind of complaining that there's a lot of the application because the fields don't talk to each other. Still the case. Even he was stepping from a, um, a statistician point of view. And I would say now they are the culprit of this because they have closed themselves in their community. And they don't see what other communities are doing. So we have the same thing today. Mathematicians go one way. Machine learning goes another way. And statisticians go another way. and hard Seldom they look into each other. Machine learning, I must say, in their favor, they do cite statisticians and mathematicians, but the others don't. <coughs> OK, that's reality. So <coughs> in the 2008 paper, they just mentioned the equivalence between these two methods based on the idea that both are the optimal solution to the problem. And if the problem has a unique solution, they must be the same. Um, <coughs> they realized, they found a paper from the 90s a guy who basically built a um, way of inverting three diagonal matrices iteratively. And if you look at what he's doing, he's doing Kalman filtering to invert that matrix. So um, <coughs> they also say, look, it must be that these things are really formally connected. <coughs> One way of connecting them formally came out recently, paper by uh, Simon Sarka and several PhD theses. <coughs> With formally unify these stationary covariance functions with Kalman filtering. So if you have a Gaussian process regression problem where you are using a stationary covariance function, which is 90% of the cases, most of the cases use those, you can mathematically write the equivalent Kalman filter. <coughs> and therefore, you can make prediction on very large a signals or inference on very large signals without the need to build these huge matrices. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so I'm going quick, but I guess with the questions we can re recap. I just want to finish to show you what I have, and then we can <coughs> discuss on the part you find more interesting. Um, so how it is done? Again, this is technical, but if you are interested, we can. Essentially, this wiener kinchin theorem, it's a very clever theorem, um, says that if you have a signal of a, a stochastic process that is stationary in a very 
a weak sense. So you know the statistics don't have to change over time, and some details there. But essentially, it's like we, I would put it like this: for most signals you're going to ever see uh, in linear systems. Uh, you can take the spectral density, kind of a Fourier transform of that signal. You do the inverse Fourier transform, and you're going to obtain a covariance matrix. Therefore, if you have a, a system that is generating signals, and you do this process, you can write, OK, what's the covariance function you should be <coughs> doing inference with uh, on this system. And that's essentially what they do. Here we show it quickly. So let's start. We start here. We have a function that comes from a prior Gaussian process. And we have some data we have observed, and then we want to condition a. So we want to find one of all these possible uh, functions. We want to find one, or at least we want to find the mean value, the mean function. And to do this, if you are taking again a special a spatial temporal Gaussian process, you will have to consider all the time samples you have, all the spatial measurements you have, and you will take a time that is cubic with that number. And this quickly gets. You cannot do it on the computer. It takes too long. Not to mention the memory you need to store these metrics. Um, so this, in general, is a dead end quite quickly. Unless you are dealing with, with something that is very sparse, you cannot do this. And if you are thinking, again, on linear uh, on um, signal processing, where you're going to have high, highly sampled signals, this is unfeasible. Nobody does this, except IBM, maybe. They want to do it. I don't know why, but they're still pushing that thing forward. Um, so, um, and this theorem or this method, what it says, okay, if you start here and this, the covariance here is a uh, stationary, you can write a system like the ones we were seeing before when you wrote Kalman filter, where now you have a vector that is different from this f, of course, and then you have some operators that will be derived from this k and mean value you have here. And if you are able to do this, you're going to reach into an algorithm that is now linear on the time samples, but still kind of cubic on the spatial measurements. So now if you have a sparse grid of sensors, but these sensors are producing a lot of time, da time data, then you probably want to do this. right? Um, if your grid is not that sparse, it's still better to do this than this if you have several time samples. Now if you have a single snapshot, so this one t is one, and you have a very dense obs observation grid. Then it doesn't matter what you do; you will infer, you will go into the same cost. Right? And the process goes like this: first, you compute the spectral density, so of this system formally, a Fourier transform basically. Then you're gonna approximate this with a rational function for a stationary covariance function linear system. You don't need to do this. So basically, just compute the spectral density. Then you're going to remove the uh, poles, so the zeros of the denominator of this, so the points where the uh, spectral density diverges. You're going to remove those. You're going to just smooth them out. This will give you what is called a, fine, uh, a stable transfer function, so a thing that doesn't add energy to your system. And then you're going to use a control theory methods that convert exactly transfer functions into state space models. Right? So this is for for the guys who do control or uh, signal processing. This is a standard way of going. It's very simple. The only different part is this, the first one, because now it involves the Fourier transform of the covariance matrix. But if you remove the first line, this is what always people do in linear control theory. Will take with a system. They will do the impulse response. <coughs> with impulse response, they will get the transfer function, and then they will use this method they have to build the actual model of the system. Right? It's a very standard methodology here. The only part is the Kinchin, wiener kinchin theorem here that says you need to convert the covariance function through the Fourier transform. Um, and this is all on the paper and the thesis I cited before. Oh, well, it's here again, the two things. So just to look at these things we were mentioning before. So this is the view from the Gaussian process perspective. What you have is this field, right? this function now we are Consider also space. So we have, for example, the location on a map, <coughs> and then the time. So this could be, for example, rain gauges, measurements of rain gauges. And um, in the Gaussian process approach, we're going to take any two points here, and we're going to say how similar they are, how correlated they are. No? Any two points there. So in a way, we, need, we are looking at this whole surface in one snapshot. 
because we can compute properties of any two points here. Doesn't matter which one. You can choose. You can compute all these properties. When you move to the uh, Kalman filter or the state space view, you have only this cut of that surface. So at a given uh, point in time, you only see the state of your system along the spatial di direction. <coughs> and then you're going to start moving this window, this slide there. Um, <coughs> and this is how you're going to build the new uh, points that come in the future. Or in the past, <coughs> these things are reversible. So here are examples of different covariance functions that come from this perspective of the world, but solved now as iterative methods. So forward in time, you're going to kind of solve the differential equation that produces the output of these covariance functions. And so here you have matern covariance functions. These are a square exponential. So you will see that most of the, fun of the covariance functions that are used on machine learning have all these nice properties. And with all of them, you can do this trick. <coughs> so in a way, it's a little bit pointless to do special temporal regression with Gaussian processes. But you know, people are not fully <laughs> aware of this. I was not even aware of this till last year. Um, OK, so um, this is an example. Again, if you want to see how this looks like, this is the matern covariant function. He has this shape like this. So your inputs in this case are time, only time. So this we're talking like an ODE kind of process. Um, and the covariance function between two times separated by this distance will be given by an equation like this. This k1 here, you can think is an exponential decay. So it's like an exponential decay. So the further these points are, the less correlated they are in an exponential manner. Uh, this is the second kind modified Bessel function, but it's just an exponential. Um, and then this lambda that measures you know, how, how fast this decay is. So if you take this guy, you can convert it with the method before into this linear dynamical system. Uh, where the um, lambda comes there. And if you are a physics fan, you will see this is a, over, a critically damp uh, oscillator with s in some thermal noise, so in some thermal bath. So this is an oscillator that uh, has the property that if you kick it, it will stop very quickly without oscillating. But it's permanently being kicked in a Gaussian manner by some you know, particles or some noise there. So this guy here, if you now do Kalman filtering with this guy, is the same as if we were doing Gaussian regression with this covariance function here. And you can go spatial temporal as well. And then here, you, you take the same uh, matern covariance function. But now the input is the distance in space and time. So you have to measure okay, what it means to say, OK, we are separated by this distance and away in time. But you can take just a Euclidean norm for that, if that makes sense. Doesn't matter, really. This is something you choose. And um, so if you do now this process we mentioned before, you come into this. I don't know if somebody wants to raise a hand there and say, hey, 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 hey. See something weird there? If you look at this matrix. So you say it's a linear dynamical system, a partial differential equation. You have complaints about that. Or any, maybe Carlo sees something weird there. No? Maybe not, because if you're used to this kind of system, it's not weird. But essentially, here is the square root of a differential of the second derivative. Oh, here, sorry, I'm missing the square there. This is a second derivative. And here is a second derivative inside of a square root. So these are called, so these are not simple differential equations. They're a little bit more uh, compromised, but you can still do it. So you don't need to know these details to apply these methods. The only thing is that if you do the math, you arrive to systems that may not be physical in a way. May not represent physical system, yeah? Is the, so this is you apply it as a as a matrix. So you will take zero times this one, one times this one, and then second derivative of this guy minus lambda of that guy minus two times the square root of lambda second derivative of that guy, right? And then you have to make okay, what does it mean to take you know lambda minus the derivative square root? What's what's that? But again, these are it's called a uh, pseudo differential uh, operators, and you can work with them numerically. It's not a problem, and you don't need to know this. You just say okay, I have a fraction there or 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 a um, so again, what I'm trying to say is that this mathematically complicated, numerically, there are libraries out there to handle with this thing. So uh, you need to worry. Um, so intermediate summary, because I want to go to the tricks now, and we have 10 minutes. Uh, we kind of unify these three methods 
and in certain situations. Where we have a linear uh, state space model, when you have a stationary Gaussian processes covariance function, and when you have convex loss function for the then these things are equivalent. You can go from one to the other. And what is this good for? You may want to use some view to make your algorithms. For example, this view, very good to run your algorithms, very bad to interpret, very bad. The you can, um, intuition of this is horrible, right? very hard to get. But you go to your Gaussian process representation, and intuition is very easy. So you can kind of use one representation to understand your system, another representation to implement your actual algorithms. Um, you can also you know, go back and forth and improve things in different spaces, let's say, in different representations where you feel more comfortable with. Um, so where you can inject your, your prior knowledge more efficiently. And um, so this advantage of this is clear. You can do inference in linear time in the number of time samples. And the good thing about regression and G, uh, is now you don't have to propose a particular family of functions. Right? So when you, in regular regression, you have usually have to say what f look like. <coughs> so you have some polynomials, or you have some uh, basis functions, whatever. When you go to GP, you don't need to do this anymore. You just say, OK, I'm going to use this covariance function, and then the function will come out. And it will be something. Um, and that's it. So now, OK, what's an emulator? Very quickly, and I will see three minutes for this. So we have these simulators that you all probably have, where you put some inputs, not many. You, know, you define it in your configuration file. And then the simulator expands these inputs into many internal states, runs a simulation. We'll get each of these guys will be time signals. But then you're going to evaluate some uh, functionals on those signals. You're going to take the integral, so to compute the total of something, or uh, you're going to get only one of those signals, not all of them. So for example, the flow, uh, the outflow at some point. So you're going to kind of compress. So you're going to fan out from your inputs and then compress again. And that means that you can think, OK, well, I could try to find directly the mapping from input to output. If so, those dimensional things, I should be able to do this. Um, and this is the case with emulation. Now, you may want to also get the full internal states. In this case, people don't talk about emulators. They talk about reduced order modeling. You can still speed up things doing these tricks, even if the outputs are not only a few. But if there are a few, we usually people call it emulator. So you kind of skip all the internal representations the simulator will use to get to the result. Here is a, an example. So here we have a, a tube where there is some flow running, and the input is basically the the, um, a description of the velocity field on, on one on the inlet. And then you see there is a parameter here, which is how quick squeeze this tube is. Right? So you get here quicker, a little bit quicker, and here you get some turbulences. And the idea here is that we're going to want to use this snapshot to tell what's going to happen in, for other values of this uh, tube uh, squeezing. Right? So this will be your parameter. And, um, and the idea basically is that there is uh, a manifold is called of solutions that you don't know. You're going to observe these things which at some point. This will be the snapshot. And then with those, you're going to build this red line. And you hope this, this, the distance between the red line and the black line will not be too big. That's the hope. right? And the good thing is that this can be done, can be proved even formally that you can do this for PDEs. And I'm um, not going to talk about that. But essentially, what you have there is a measure called Conmore M width, which is basically the singular values of your data set. And um, what you see is that here is a number of samples of snapshots of your system you're going to use. Uh, this, OK, we're going to go into this, but I want to turn for you the intuition. We have a system, a, a simulator. We're going to sample it 25 times, 50, 100, uh, 5,000. And then we're going to take this set of signals, and we're going to take the singular values. We're going to compress it using PCA or SVD. And then we look how these components are decreased on importance. right? And when we see that quickly, they go to 0, essentially. That means that I take these principal components, and beyond the number 50, they don't provide any information. That means, essentially, that this system can be perfectly emulated with 50 snapshots. Right? The error will be below 10 to the power of minus 8 if you take 50 good snapshots. Right? And um, and be happy, because this sampling here was done with a Latin hypercube, so they consider one of the most optimal sampling of the space of solutions. So, um, and this is a comparison between squares are 
Um, ah, this is the number of samples. Okay, I have another slide where you have uh, different methods and see how this thing goes. But uh, essentially is that, that by looking how this thing decays, you can estimate quickly, okay, what's the maximum number of snapshots I should use from my system to, to emulate it properly, okay? You don't need the full system, that's the whole thing, yeah. So you need a complete solution set to begin with? You need a data set of solutions, yes. You need these snapshots, you need them. You need those snapshots. So to emulate, to uh, speed up the model, you're gonna run your model several times, and then you're gonna use those results to build up a guessing function that will tell you your outputs without running the actual simulator. So you're gonna extrapolate or interpolate, if you want, based on those snapshots. So it's the complete solution set data or also simulation? What do you mean by complete solution set? Well, you, you mentioned it on your so slide. Yeah, here the complete solution set is infinite because these guys you know, are continuous parameters so you can ma have as many solutions as you want. This is, the, for example, the squeezing parameter there. It's a continuous value, infinite. It's a complete, so the complete manifold is an infinite dimensional monster. <coughs> but what this is saying is that you don't need this infinite, because it's so regular, this thing has some regularities on it, but just looking at some points, you can recover the whole thing. Imagine a polynomial, right? If it's second order polynomial, we say, well, I have to describe all the values the polynomial takes for all possible inputs. And it's an infinite amount of points, but everybody knows you need three points. With three points, you describe the polynomial completely. But this right? like That's a, a it's how you how do you evaluate the complete solution set when it's infinite? These things you don't. So what you do? So practically, this is a, a toy problem where you can evaluate five thousand solutions without much cost. Right? This is what they've done, and they say, okay, for five thousand, you really see that indeed we only needed fifty solutions. Okay, so you, right? you basically stop. Yeah, but what you do in the actual thing is you're going to start with 10, with 2. So I'm, you're running. It takes 8 hours. Every 8 hours, you're going to add a point here, right? And see the trend when it's going. And then you're going to stop when this guy gets below 10 to the power of minus 6. And it's OK, well, it's 22. Right? And then you stop. Now, the trick here is how you sample these solutions. Because if you sample those solutions close to each other, this never goes down. This goes like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, So these guys here, they capture up to this, the last point on the turbulent regime, but you can capture this as well. What you cannot capture is nonlinear regimes. Like this is like linear turbulence, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so if things get really nonlinear, then you cannot, uh, this will be harder. So this uh, thing here, so what affects this reducibility? The local versus uh, global dimension of this solution manifold, the smoothness of the parameter dependence, so you have bifurcations on things that you know really break the behavior of your solutions, then you will need more and more and more samples to, to recover that. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> what I just focus on this, how, how much you can really approximate this manifold with a finite amount of uh, samples. And uh, this is basically, you, you can get this experiment, because all the other things, it's very hard to know from simulations. You really need to do a mathematical analysis to know, okay, is this thing easy or not? Uh, well, this last one, at least you can do it numerically by just running simulations and seeing, okay, how is this PCA going to zero? So how many components do I really need? Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. <coughs> and uh, we close here. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures because it's really, now it's really conceptual thing. So you have systems like this. You have systems like this, you have systems like this, right? And now, of course, you can build simulators of those guys. Well, let me keep on maybe this one that is most familiar here. You can build a simulator. I want to capture all the details, you know, this little stream here, there's a house here, it has some pipes. I want to capture the whole dynamics of this thing, right? You can do it. I mean, it's, you're an engineer. If you have you know, enough computing power, you can build all this huge model aggregated you know, into huge. I hear already something like, yeah. One model for each pipe. Okay, if you want to do it, one model for each pipe, yeah, good. <laughs> you can try. Um, point is that for some special large domain models, you have this property of kind of like self-similarity. And many of these piping systems do have this property. Um, so essentially now you can identify sub parts of these uh, domains that will repeat. And 
the trick is that you're going to solve your problem on these things that repeat. You're going to build your emulator for that thing that repeats, and then you're going to use it many times at different places and with different transformations. Here is the fern. So you have this shape that repeats at different scales along the fern. So if you're able to run your simulation on this guy, then you can transform it pop, 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 and essentially so quickly the whole thing. So these methods are already out there I published. They are not fully tested for all kind of uh, partial differential equations, but there are some working uh, results or some working solutions for many systems. The other trick, so this one divide and conquer thing. You know, if things repeat, you know, don't solve for everything, just solve for the uh, essential parts. The other thing is that you can map many things that look different into the same shape. In finite element or in variational problems, it's called master element or master domain. So you can kind of conformal mapping, if you remember your complex analysis classes. Um, so you can transform things that are curvy into things that are not curvy anymore, like squares, lines, or maybe circles. It's very curvy. but uh, and, um, and the point is that if you know how to transform this guy back, then you can stop here. And then by applying different transformations, some in different domains. Right? So you actually s solve the problem once, and then you map it to the particular situation. Right? So this is a second trick that, of course, is related. Because once you divide and conquer, oh, these things are all the same, but appear at different uh, scales, then you can solve in one of them and then rescale the solution. Right? Properly rescaling the solution. And uh, the last, um, oh, this is the same. This example is use a trick that is a lot in um, hemodynamics because you saw this heart there. You have these capillarities and you have these big veins. So this problem is very common there. You don't want to simulate all the details there. <coughs> so they break up many of these systems, in particular these uh, kind of uh, bifurcations of the veins. And then by applying what I call transfinite transformation, they can generate different um, bifurcations from a master one. So they have the, the master bifurcation, and then they will deform it, and then try to rebuild um, a vein system. This, of course, can be used in uh, sewer systems. Of course, uh, you have this situation as well, when these things will be different each time. The angle will be different each time, and etc., etc., etc. And finally, and this is the last slide. Not everything is equally important. So it may be that when you go down to certain scale. You don't need to solve your emulator or your system anymore because it's not relevant anymore. So all these parts are not relevant, though it will take time on your simulator. You're going to replace with trivial models. So one-dimensional phenomenological is a <coughs> weapon of choice at the moment. But um, people are forcing this idea of reduced models. That, uh, but I think emulators will be the ideal choice for this kind of thing. So essentially, the part that is important on your system, that you keep your complex model maybe accelerated or not, but you keep the complex model there. And then all the rest, you really replace with some quickly dirty trick. I mean, this, for example, Lawrence, you do this in your transport of uh, pebbles in the bed of the stream. This is one of the tricks you mentioned. They replace the transport equation with some uh, movement, initiation, velocity, threshold, and nothing else. So this will be one of these examples. You replace it with a phenomenological thing. So the summary of the talk is we talk about this unification of the methods. We talk about division of large domain uh, in its parts. And then you have this idea that multi-scale modeling, that at some point you don't use the full simulator. You change your simulator to something simpler or more complex, depending on what you want to um, do. And that's it.